welcome to Biz 113, Introduction to Business. Today we'll be going over the forms of business ownership. So the most common type of business we see in the U.S. is a sole proprietorship. And this is a business that's owned by only one person, thereby the word sole. Approximately 72% of U.S. businesses are sole proprietorships, and it's the easiest and cheapest type of business to form. All you really need is a business license. So, you know, what are some examples of sole proprietorship? Pretty much neighborhood businesses. You walk down a street, for example, in Media, Pennsylvania, or Haddonfield, New Jersey, and there's all these cute little shops, and it could say, you know, Smith and Sons. So, you know, Smith is the owner, his sons are the ones who work for him, and then eventually will inherit the business. But the point being is that most small companies are sole proprietorships. As a sole owner, you have complete control over your business and all the decisions that need to be made. So if you're a control queen, this is the kind of business that works best for you. You are also entitled to all of the income earned by the business, minus taxes and expenses, of course. Profits of a sole proprietorship are taxed as personal income for both federal and state taxes and there are no special business taxes attached. There are significantly fewer government regulations for this type of ownership. So, you know, when we look at the advantages, it is a great opportunity for somebody who has the drive and the skills to really make a business run. You know, you have to have a lot of energy to get this done because there's also a lot of disadvantages. If you die, the business is dissolved, meaning that if it's the um, business that is owned by one person, they pass away, well, that business license was in their name. So now, you know, even if somebody wants to buy the business, they're gonna have to take out their own business license. You have to supply or pay for all the skill sets necessary for your business. And what that means is, let's say that you are the world's greatest pizza maker, so you're gonna open up a pizza store. Well, you are gonna need somebody to run the cash register while you're making pizza. You may need somebody to come in and renovate the kitchen, so you're gonna have to pay someone to do that. The broader your skill sets, the easier it is for you to manage all these different functions. But if you have a really specific skill set, you're going to have to bring in lots of people who are going to be able to help you. You must depend on the money you make to keep the business going and to pay your personal expenses. Money borrowed for the business is loaned to you personally. Sole proprietors have unlimited liability for any losses the business face. And what that basically means is if something happens and you get sued, they're going to come after your house, your car, your dog. So if the company suffers a catastrophe, so let's say that uh, in your pizza parlor there is a spill on the floor, a customer trips, and they fracture a vertebrae, that's going to be an expensive problem. The other option is you go into deep debt. The owner is personally liable. As a sole proprietor, you put your personal assets your bank account, your car, and even your home at risk for the sake of your business. While insurance can help with lessening the risk, the owner is still wholly responsible. So you own that pizza shop, customer falls, you have insurance, business insurance. Well, the insurance will only cover so much, and then it becomes your responsibility. The second kind of ownership is called a partnership. A partnership or general partnership is a business owned jointly by two or more people. Approximately 10% of U.S. companies are partnerships, so we're not looking at a huge number. Setting up a partnership is more complicated than setting up a sole proprietorship, but it's still reasonably easy and inexpensive. 
The cost varies according to size and complexity of the business. Such major corporations started as partnerships, such as Hewlett Packard, which were two engineering guys in the um, proverbial garage creating this new system. Apple with our Steve, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, also in a garage, ironically. Ben and Jerry, who are the two guys who uh, have managed to convince us that a pint of ice cream is three servings. And Disney, brothers Walt and Roy. Now, we all know Walt Disney because he was the face of the company. But his brother, Roy Disney, served for many years um, working for the Disney Corporation after Walt died in the uh, 50 years ago. So, you know, these kind of companies you are generally seeing two people coming together with complementary skills who are able to get along and that is one of the biggest issues. Advantages, partnerships bring together a diverse group of talented individuals who share responsibility for running the business. So over here on the right you're gonna see a picture of Steve Jobs and he's the guy, tall guy on the left and Steve Wozniak who's the shorter guy on the right. A lot of people don't realize is that Steve Jobs was not a tech guy. He had ideas. He had these great ideas that accentuated art and uh, functionality. Steve Wozniak, at least in the beginning, was the guy who knew all the tech stuff. And then Steve Woz left eventually and uh, Steve Jobs ended up running the company, Apple, by himself and bringing in engineers to make his vision come true. So you have very different skill sets, but they complement each other. Second, it makes financing easier. More business owners mean more personal resources and more opportunities to get credit. The business doesn't die with the owner. Partners can agree legally to allow the partnership to survive if one or more partners die. So it can be two people, three people, five people. There's a lot of law firms that might have 30 people and they're all partners. But the point is that this partnership is an entity unto itself and it can continue. Disadvantages. Each partner is personally liable, not only for his or her own actions, but also for the actions of all the partners. And again, this is called unlimited liability. If the business doesn't have the cash or other assets to cover losses, the business partners can be personally sued for the amount owed. Being a partner means that you have to share decision making and many people find this challenging when differences in opinion begin to escalate. And in many ways, it is like a marriage. You have two people who spend a huge amount of time together. Could be three people, could be four people, but let's take the two people concept. They spend a huge amount of time together and you're not always going to agree. And unless you have some good communication skills, you may end up in a scenario where you can't even talk to your business partner because you hate them so much. When things get irreconcilable, a word we often hear with divorce, then the partnership could potentially end. Now, partners also share profits. This arrangement can work as long as all partners feel that they're being rewarded according to their efforts and accomplishments. And again, perception is reality. If a partner believes that he or she is bringing in more business than the other partners, but he or she is not being rewarded to that extent, then you're going to see some anger and resentment, which then loops back to the irreconcilable differences. Now we also have something called a limited partnership and this was developed to overcome the problem of partnerships and the law allows a limited partnership to have two types of partners. You have a single general partner who runs the business and is responsible for its liabilities. Number two, any number of limited partners ha who have limited involvement in the business and whose losses are limited to the amount of their investment. And you see this kind of model very often in family-run businesses. 
So let's say you have a plumbing company, Johnson Plumbing. And in Johnson Plumbing, it's run by the dad, Mr. Johnson. And he has two sons and a daughter who have also followed in his footsteps. They are limited partners and they may be using sweat equity, which means they're working for a reduced rate to gain some ownership in the company, or they're just being paid like regular old um, employees, but they're reinvesting some of their paycheck back into the business. The concept here is, it's basically like a sole proprietorship with the advantages of a partnership. Now, one of the most important parts of any partnership is the partnership agreement. A well-planned partnership agreement specifies everyone's rights and responsibilities. The agreement might provide such details as the amount of cash and other contributions to be made by each partner, division of partnership income or loss, partner responsibilities, who does what, conditions under which a partner can sell an interest in the company. So for example, we have the plumber, he has two sons and a daughter. One of the sons decides that he doesn't want to be a plumber anymore. He wants to pursue his career on, um, let's say, dance. He wants to go to dance school. Well, he wants to sell his part of the business. Well, can he sell it to another partner or can he sell it to a third party, an outside person? Does he have to sell within the partnership? So. These kinds of things need to be worked out in advance. There are also various conditions for dissolving the partnership that need to be worked out and conditions for settling disputes. Many times you will be in a situation in a partnership where arbitration is mandated before any dissolution of the partnership with the idea that you were a calmer person when you weren't pissed off at your partner and in the partnership agreement you both agreed to arbitration. So moving on, corporations and they're also called a regular or C corporation differs from a sole proprietorship and a partnership because it is a legal entity that is entirely separate from the parties who own it. In a sense a corporation is its own person and this was ratified by the Supreme Court about 10 years ago in a case decision where they said that corporations can donate money to politicians as a so-called person, which really validated the idea of corporations being people. This is very controversial and you know there's going to be people who disagree, other people who agree that corporations should be seen as people. It can enter into binding contracts, buy and sell property, sue and be sued, be held responsible for its actions, and be taxed. Corporations account for only 18% of all businesses, but they account for 82% of all business revenue in the US. So over here on the right, you'll see these charts. The top chart is the number of businesses. We have corporations at 18%, partnerships at 10%, and sole proprietors at, 20, at 72%. The sales revenue, however, is flip-flopped. Corporations make 82%, partnerships make 14%, and sole proprietors only make 4% of business revenue. And that's really, you know, when you're competing, you know, Bob's Plumbing versus Coca-Cola, well, obviously Coca-Cola is going to make a ton more money. But just to give you some perspective on where the money is really going, these small businesses are important, but they don't bring in the huge revenue that you see in corporations. Now, corporations are owned by shareholders who invest money in the business by buying shares of stock. The portion of the corporation they own depends on the percentage of stock they hold. For example, if a corporation has issued 100 shares of stock and you own 30 shares, you own 30% of the company. Now the reality is most corporations are selling millions and millions of shares of stock. 
So owning 30 shares is not going to make you a senior owner. You have to play in the big leagues like Warren Buffett, who is probably the country's best known investor, who will go in and spend three or four hundred million dollars on a block of stock in order to take control of a company. That is not a very common thing though, because as we know, there's only one Warren Buffett, although there are several who are in that league. Shareholders elect a board of directors. Now this is a group of people, primarily from outside the corporation, who are legally responsible for governing the corporation. The board oversees the major policies and decisions made by the corporation, sets goals and holds management accountable for achieving them, and hires and evaluates the very top executives. The board is also going to be approving the distribution of income to shareholders in the form of cash payments called dividends. And we'll talk about that later on in the term in a lot more detail. But just in a nutshell, when you own stock, every year the company decides that for every share of stock you're going to get a certain amount of money back, and that's called the dividend, and you pay tax on that. That dividend can be four cents, it could be four dollars, it could be a hundred dollars. Depends on the company, depends on the dividends, de depends on primarily the performance of the company. And just because you hold stock doesn't mean you're going to get dividends because some shareholder or uh, corporations don't always give out the dividends, especially if the company's not doing well. Um, oh, this picture on the right are some of the largest companies in this country. And you'll see, you know, Dr. Pepper in Texas, Coors in Colorado. Uh, we have Apple in California, Nike in Oregon, Starbucks in Washington, and of course we have Hooters in Florida. So the advantages of a corporation or incorporating, you have limited liability for shareholders. Shareholders are not responsible for the obligations of the corporation and they can lose no more than the amount that they have personally invested in the company. So let's say, for example, that you are very excited about this new company you recently read about. So you take $1,000 and you buy stock in this company. Well, a year later, the company ends up going under. And as a consequence, you have lost that $1,000. You don't owe anything beyond that $1,000. <coughs> there are greater avail availability of financial resources. Incorporation makes it possible for businesses to raise funds by selling stock, i.e. shares of ownership in the company. Also, an established corporation can borrow its own funds, but when a small business needs a loan, the bank usually requires that it is guaranteed by its owners. Specialized management. Corporations pay high salaries and offer good benefits and that helps them attract better employees and partnerships and sole proprietors. There are some incredibly well-known managers who work in the uh, top corporations. One of the probably the most <coughs> well-known in banking is Jamie Dimon who um, is making somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 or 30 million dollars a year. So obviously your, you know, Joe's plumbing can't keep up with that. Finally, there's continuity, and this is the corporation has a legal life separate from the lives of its owners, and it can theoretically exist forever. Transferring ownership of a corporation is easy. Shareholders simply sell their stock to others. So you have some companies like Coca-Cola that have been around for over a hundred years and there's no sign of them stopping anytime soon. Okay, so under the concept of corporations, we have two kinds. You have public corporations and private corporations. Private corporations are corporate are when a corporate founder wants to restrict the transferability of their stock and they choose to operate as a privately held corporation. 
The stock in these corporations is held by only few individuals who are not allowed to sell it to the general public. So, for example, you, and these are some of the more well-known private corporations, Uber, Mars, and they make um, the candy M&Ms, which we all know and love, Dell Technologies, Wawa, the true uh, mid-Atlantic highlight of all of our mornings, Ashley Furniture, Levi Strauss and Company, and Bass Pro Shops. So I'm going to use Wawa as the example since most of us who live in the mid-Atlantic or Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware region um, know and love our Wawa's with a passion that most people cannot begin to understand. So you work at Wawa. You are the guy who rings people up or makes sandwiches. You have an opportunity as an employee of Wawa to gain stock options. So after two or three years of working there, you have 20, 30, 40 shares of stock. Well, you can't just go and sell that to anyone. It has to go back to Wawa. So you're still making money, but ultimately you can cash out, but you're selling the shares back to Wawa. Companies that have no such restrictions on stock sales are called public corporations and the stock is available for sale to the general public. And you see this with Coca-Cola, with Disney, with um, Nike. You know, these are big companies that people have a significant investment in. Disadvantages of incorporation. Managers and employees are often more interested in career advancement than the overall profitability of the company. Now, this comes in oftentimes, especially at the highest level. Many years ago, Disney decided to hire a Hollywood agent to be their CEO, the guy who runs the company. And this guy was really very much responsible in the 80s of um, trying to kill Disney in many ways. And Finally, Disney paid him like $20 million to leave because <clears throat> otherwise he, they'd be violating his contract. This guy was so much more focused on his own advancement that he didn't worry about this company that employs thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So stockholders often care about profits without regard to the well-being of employees. So again, what you see here is and we see it with retail a lot. So you have somebody who works at Walmart. They make eight or nine dollars an hour. And they get 30 or five, 40 hours a week. So let's say 40 hours times nine is 360. So by the time they pay taxes and they pay whatever uh, FICA they have to, they may end up with 275, 250, every paycheck week. That's about $1,100 a month, which comes to about $13,000 a year. It is obvious in this country that you cannot live anywhere on $13,000 a year. So what these companies end up doing is focusing their employees on gaining government benefits like food stamps, um, child care credits, those kind of things. So they rely on the government to um, supplement their employees' very low wages. Well, why are they being paid so little? It's because the stockholders want the profit ration, ration to be higher. And so as the CEO, your job is not to cater to your employees, but it's really to cater to the board of directors who answer to the shareholders. So the shareholders dictate that people should not be paid a huge amount of money. Now, this is all well and good if the company is not doing well. But when the company is doing extraordinarily well, it looks really bad. It looks terrible um, from the perspective of, for example, Amazon just decided to increase their lowest paid individuals to $15 an hour, which is great because they were getting so much flack from the people who buy from Amazon and saying, why can't you pay your people a living wage? 
So corporations are costly to set up, ranging anywhere from $1,000 to $6,000 for fees, for licenses, and attorney costs. Corporations are subject to a level of regulation and governmental oversight that places a burden on small businesses. Corporations are subject to what's called double taxation. Corporations are taxed by the federal and state governments on their earnings. When these earnings are distributed as dividends, the shareholder pays taxes on these dividends. Corporate profits are thus taxed twice. The corporation pays the taxes the first time and the shareholder pay the taxes the second time. Now over here on the left, I've put together a little visual for you to see this. We have corporation ABC. They take whatever money they've made, they pay tax on their profit, and they distribute dividends to shareholders. Then those shareholders must pay taxes on dividend income. So what you're seeing is the corporation and the shareholders both pay tax, ergo double taxation. Now, there are smaller types of business organizations that you don't see as commonly as a sole proprietorship, a partnership, or a corporation. Cooperatives are one of those, and it's also known as a co-op. And this is a business owned and controlled by those who use its services. If it's run correctly, cooperatives increase profits for its producer members and lower costs for its consumer members. Cooperatives are very common in the agricultural community. For example, some 750 cranberry and grapefruit member growers market their cranberry sauce, fruit juices, and dried cranberries through the Ocean Spray Cooperative. So, you know, the folks who make this juice, the Ocean Spray, um, they have specific vendors that they buy from because they're all members of the same cooperative. Then we have nonprofit corporations. A nonprofit or a not for profit corporation is an organization formed to serve some public purpose rather than for financial gain. As long as the organization's activity is for charitable, religious, educational, scientific, or literary purposes, it should be exempt from paying income taxes. Individuals and other organizations that contribute to the not-for-profit corporation can take a tax deduction for those contributions. So some of the uh, more well-known examples of these is the Red Cross, the United Way, St. Jude's Children's Hospital, the American Cancer Society, Planned Parenthood, the American SPCA, PBS, and the Midwest Food Bank. Um, additionally, our College, the Pennsylvania Institute of Technology, is also a nonprofit because all of the money that we earn in tuition gets poured right back into the company. Um, no one takes a profit. Now, moving on to some hybrid forms of organizations, and a lot of these have evolved over the last 30 or 40 years as we begin to understand the limitations of the three big forms of organization. So S corporations are not subject to double taxation and they do limit personal liability. So that's kind of the best of both worlds. S corporation eligibility criteria. Now you're gonna see that this criteria is very specific. The company has no more than 100 shareholders. So it's gonna be a small corporation. All shareholders are individuals, estates, or certain nonprofits or trusts. All shareholders are U.S. citizens and permanent residents of the United States. The business is not a bank or insurance company. All shareholders concur with the decision to form an S corporation. In an S corporation, profits must be allocated based on percentage ownership. So if an owner or shareholder holds 25% of stock in the S corporation, 25% of the company profits are allocated to this shareholder regardless of the amount of effort he or she exerts in running the business. So you could have somebody who, you know, put up all the money, you know, put up a lot of money, 
They never even come to the business. People don't even know what they look like, but they're still going to get a big chunk of the profits because they set up the initial investment. Additionally, the owners have to follow a number of formal procedures, such as electing a board of directors and holding annual meetings. Additionally, they are also subjected to heavy record-keeping requirements. Its members, in this case of a limited liability company, are called members rather than shareholders. The limited liability company dictates that the owners are not personally liable for debts of the company, ergo the limited liability. Limited. Earnings are taxed only once at the personal level and that eliminates double taxation. Unlike S corporations, it can have as many members as it wants. It is not restricted to a maximum of 100 shareholders. Its members do not have to be U.S. residents or citizens. Profits do not have to be allocated to owners based on percentage ownership. Members can distribute profits in any way they want. It is easier to operate because it doesn't have as many rules and restrictions as does an S corporation. It doesn't have to elect a board of directors, hold annual meetings, or deal with heavy record-keeping burden. So these limited liability companies, and they're also known as an LLC, you're going to see that in the title of a lot of companies these days because for you know, um, a company that is um, small enough, having this kind of venue is a much better option than dealing with corporation issues. Now there are, are always going to be exceptions to limited liability and the shareholder or the member might be held personally liable for the debts of his or her company in certain circumstances. So if they personally guarantee a business debt or bank loan which the company fails to pay. Number two, fails to pay employment taxes to the government that were withheld from wager, workers' wages. So you withhold the federal and state taxes as the employer, but you don't bother to send it to the government. Yeah, they're going to be very annoyed about that. Number three, engages in fraudulent or illegal behavior that harms the company or someone else. We're going to discuss this in a lot more detail when we get um, to ethics later on. Um, there's a company out in Texas, well was a company out in Texas called Enron and the CFO, that's the chief financial officer, the chief executive officer and the guy who ran the board of directors all ended up going to jail because they were um, committing all kinds of fraudulent behavior that ended up bankrupting the company. And number four, does not treat the company as a separate legal entity, for example, they use the company assets for personal use. So you are the pretty high up in a company, you decide that you want to take a weekend trip to the Caribbean, and instead of booking a flight through Southwest Airlines or US Airways, you decide to take the corporate jet. And um, that corporate jet crashes and lands on you know, people playing football, a whole bunch of people die. Well, they're going to come after the person who borrowed the jet in addition to the company. So it is a um, unusual circumstance, but it does occasionally happen. Another kind of business um, situation that we see are mergers and acquisitions. A merger occurs when two companies combine to form a new company. An acquisition is the purchase of one company by another and no new company is formed. So what you see over here on the right is a visual representation of this. An acquisition, and that's the yellow guy, add the peach looking guy, and basically the yellow guy swallows up the peach guy and becomes a much bigger yellow guy. Whereas a merger is much more like making a baby. You got the mommy and the daddy company and they come together and they form a bigger company where both mommy and daddy 
are very, um, have equal relationships. Major rationales behind mergers and acquisitions include the company combined is more valuable together than the value of two separate companies. They gain complementary products. So let's say that one company produces peanut butter and another company produces chocolate and they merge and now they can make their own peanut butter chocolates that everybody loves. Enter new markets or gain new distribution channels. You'll often see mergers between companies in different countries. So for example, you might have a company in Germany that merges with a company in the United States. This allows the United States to distribute products more easily in Germany and then the Germans can distribute products more easily in the United States. And then finally, achieve higher efficiency. So um, you get rid of all the people who are doing the same job as somebody else. So there are occasions when a merger or acquisition gets nasty, and this is called a hostile takeover. A hostile takeover occurs when co one company wants to acquire another company, but that company doesn't want to be acquired. The company takes control that's resisted by the targeted company's management and its board of directors. Now that sounds a little confusing, so I have an example over here on the right. Vodafone is a British telecommunications company, and they took over Monsman, a German mobile phone company, for about $183 billion in stock in 1999. This merger was the first time a German company had been taken over by a foreign company. Vodafone and Monsman waged an intense battle for about three months before Monsman ultimately acquiesced to Vodafone's demands. Monsman's shareholders received about 59 shares of Vodafone for every share of Monsman they owned. So in this hostile takeover, it's the shareholders who said, wait a second, I'm going to get so many more shares of stock in a company that is doing really well. Why wouldn't I want to do this? Now, the, the people who are running the company, the board of directors, the CEO, the CFO, they may not be enthusiastic because they might lose their jobs, but the shareholders are going to drive this hostile takeover because they want to make themselves benefit. So that's it for today. If you have any questions, please text or email me. If you have questions but you are not in this class, please leave a comment and I will respond as quickly as I can. Thank you and have a great day.